Welcome to Music Forever, a podcast by the New Horizons International Music Association. I am Irene Cohen. Susan Shermer holds a Bachelor in Science degree in Music Education and Theory Composition from Indiana State University and a Master's of Music in Music Theory and Composition from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Susan's music career spans more than 30 years of music education in the public school system in the Lakota District in Ohio. Her career includes teaching elementary through high school students. She has conducted both student and faculty musicals at Lakota High, as well as musicals for other groups and churches. She has performed in the Cincinnati Park band concerts as a member of the Cincinnati Musicians Union. She has played clarinet with the Southwest Ohio Symphonic Band, Seven Hills Sinfionetta, and Cincinnati Metropolitan Orchestra. About 20 years ago, she founded the Westchester Symphony and has been its conductor ever since. She has worked with the New Horizons Band of Cincinnati since 2012, beginning as the clarinet instructor and currently as one of three conductors of the group. She was co-director of the Cincinnati New Horizons Music Camp in 2023 and 2024. Susan shares her love for music and music education during this interview at the NEMA Cincinnati Music Camp in June 2024. Well, hello, Susan. Thank you for doing this interview here in beautiful Lawrenceburg. The first question usually is, how did music get in your life? Probably a couple of avenues. I have an older sister who started playing clarinet in fifth grade. But my dad had studied violin as a young man, though he did not continue with it for various reasons. But there was always music in the house. My mother would sing while she was dusting the bookcase. Things like that, that it was just just always there. I had a toy saxophone that actually worked. It had some kind, I can't remember well enough, but it had some kind of a reed inside the mouthpiece so you actually blew on it and had a little songbook and had keys on it and the keys were kind of color-coded to go with the songbook. And I used to play that thing all the time. And I just love this little toy saxophone. So strangely enough, when fifth grade came along, they had abandoned the beginning band program in the elementary. And my sister had started there. And I was incensed that I didn't get to start beginning band. So my parents bought me a clarinet. And I started taking lessons following my sister's lessons with the private teacher. And that's how I started playing. Okay. And so your first inter- instrument was really clarinet. Okay. Clarinet, a toy saxophone. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Where did you grow up, Susan? Terre Haute, Indiana. So I'm a Hoosier back home here. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we are in Indiana right now. Yeah. And so um, as you were getting into high school and so on, uh, did you choose any other instruments or did you continue with clarinet? I just played clarinet. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's okay. (laughs) So I played and took private lessons all the way through high school. And then I went to college to be a music teacher in my hometown, Terre Haute. It was Indiana State University. And did you play in band as well, or was it uh, strictly private lessons? No, I played in band all the way through high school, junior high, high school. And, of course, in college, played in band. And I was in high school. I was in the old county U70. Um, so I played clarinet in that. I played clarinet in my high school orchestra as well as in band. So you completed your music education degree. Mm-hmm. And where did things go from there? Well, I went on and got a master's degree. I actually have a, a dual um, degree. I have music education and theory composition. So I went ahead and got a master's degree and then went out into the teaching world. Yeah. So you have a very long history and background 
in teaching people that are beginning to people that are fairly yeah. advanced? I spent most of my career teaching beginning band, though I had done high school and middle school and all those other things, but most of my career was spent with beginners. And of course, you had a personal life as well, beside working. And tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> yes, I have two sons. I've uh, been married to my husband for almost 30 years. Both of my boys were in band and played tr trumpet players and couldn't grow any woodwind players. As a matter of fact, my younger one uh, was a high school band director out in Arizona for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. He's in a between jobs right now. And you obviously have taken on some other instruments besides clarinet. What, what yeah. else do you play? So when I was in college, I had to have a lot of dental things done with orthodonture and stuff that interfered with my clarinet playing. So I ended up in the flute studio and learning to play flute, which was an absolutely amazing thing to do because I got to play a whole other world of music. It's not available to a clarinet player. So I love playing all the Baroque music, and I studied with a phenomenal flute teacher. I Once I got things done, I went back to clarinet, but I did not give up the flute. So I actually was doing both and ended up even doing my senior recital on flute and clarinet. So, and, and you were playing saxophone the other day, so that's sort of a... Right, I just kind of picked up saxophone, as a lot of clarinet players do, mm -hmm. and... My best saxophone education was here in Cincinnati, where I got into playing with a group called CMT, which is a community theater group that was a very high-level music theater group. And the director, uh, I was subbing in his district at the time, and he needed another reed player. And he says, well, can you play sax? I said, well, a little, I'll play flute clarinet. So he says, okay. I think we're doing Hello, Dolly. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay. So I come into the pit, and of course, I'm the youngster. And I'm sitting next to these guys who really played saxophone. And I just learned so much from them because they're teaching me as we're playing about the style and how you do this. And I got all this saxophone education from people who really played the instrument. One of them had actually played burlesque. Wow. Yeah, wow. and had toured around the country as a young man. And so these gentlemen were just phenomenal saxophone players. And so I learned kind of on the job training to play saxophone. Yeah, yeah, that as well. And obviously with your music background, it was probably more about technique than, than understanding how to play music, <laughs> uh, which helps a lot. But the style, particularly the big band style yeah. and actually playing that, because I never got the opportunity to do that in high school or college. Mm -hmm. So I had heard a lot of it because that was my parents' era. And so I was familiar with the music in my ear but to actually how you play it and, you know, get sounds and how you do things to the notes, I learned that from those gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So at some point in time, New Horizons came on your radar. I retired in 2011. I taught for over 30 years, and my school district was doing away with beginning band as it had been, and meant my job was disappearing. So I decided to retire while I could. In that next year, Pete Metzger, who was a director of the Cincinnati New Horizons Band, and I knew Pete because he was a band director at Sycamore High School, and I knew Pete, and I had played for him in park bands, which was a big tradition in Cincinnati for over 100 years, of these union park bands that would tour around to the different locations in the city and put on concerts. So I had played for Pete, I knew him, we were both band directors, and he says, hey, I need a clarinet instructor. And I said, okay, what is this? I had never heard of New Horizons. So I came in in 2012, and I'm still here. Fantastic. What is it about New Horizons, the New Horizons program, that you find attractive enough to stay there for so long? It's the people. It's that they're really wanting to play the music and they're wanting to learn and there's a camaraderie and they support each other. And as a beginning band director, you know that supporting your, your students and motivating them, but doing it in that kind way that they want to play, that it's fun, that it's something that brings them joy. 
it's the same model. I said, there's really, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but there's not much difference between teaching beginners how to play an instrument and, and then teaching an adult who's a beginner or an adult who has come back to it after many years of absence and helping them and guiding them to, yes, you can do this. You will be able to do this. You just got to, you know, hang in there and just working and working with them and bringing them along. And they, they make great music together. It's not like people have this idea like, oh, you know, what is this, a bunch of seniors that it's not going to... No, we don't. We make good music together. And then the joy of doing it, and I, and I get to play different things and different kinds of music, and now I get to direct the group. And it's just it's just a real wonderful sense of making music together. Yeah, wonderful. And you're not the first one saying that description of, of learning and socialization and being just this fun group together that that is so unique to New Horizons. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Cincinnati group? Uh, what what ensembles do you have? Okay, so um, when I joined the band, there was the band and there was a Dixieland band that had been pulled out of that quite a few years ago. Then slowly other things have started happening where Jack Conway, one of our other directors, uh, has formed a swing band. And then we have a German band or an Umpa band as well in the group. And so we have a lot of different avenues and different kinds of music for people to participate in and experience. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Do you have a string program as well? No, we do not. There is a string program in Cincinnati. It's uh, run by Betty and Gottlieb. And um, so that's a separate thing, but we have done some joint concerts together. So at some point in time, somebody must have approached you to say, let's do a band camp or a music event in Cincinnati. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because you're, you're, you've pulled off terrific gatherings for musicians. So Russ Rosen, our president, has been batting the idea around that we should have a band camp here at that time, band camp. I had never been to one. Then the pandemic came, so it kind of went to the back burner. And then once we got out of that, he said, no, we, we need to do this. And so last year we put on our first one, and it was a lot of learning and a lot of investigating about what had been done before at camps and what seemed to be things that people liked and what they would like tweaked and read a lot of reviews of previous camps to see what people wanted and so that's how we approached it. And then we have the three of us. So Jack Conway handles more of the, so I guess I'd call it the personnel matters and who, what instruments are in what group and that kind of stuff. And I pretty much handle the scheduling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you've split it up very nicely so that everybody has their responsibility and uh, you know who does what. This particular week is full of unique classes. Um, this year, you've also added on quite an extensive string program, mm -hmm. and you also are able to bring in local people who teach one class or whatever the case may be. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? So when we designed this camp last year, one of the things I thought was unique about Cincinnati area is we have such a wealth of musicians here between the University CCM and in Mount St. Joe and Xavier and Northern Kentucky University, but we also have Cincinnati Symphony here. And because I have just been around here a long time and played and, and know people, it seemed to me that we could offer a slightly different experience at our camp simply because of where we were located. So we had access to people who could come in and just do a, an hour and a half, one day master class on flute or horn or low brass or whatever it might be, and just give people uh, another voice to hear about their instrument and things that they could do. And it was wonderful, the response I got from people who had no idea New Horizons even existed, but and when I explained it and told them about it, they were on board with coming to do these one day, you know, hour and a half length master classes for our, our people here coming to the camp. And and it has just worked out really well. And it kind of breaks up the camp, too, because you do the same thing, same thing. Oh, we got something special going on this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a nice little change of pace on top of it. So we were just, I thought we were uniquely positioned because of where we were 
and the quality of music and performers that we have in this area to to utilize them mm-hmm. to come and share that with our uh, participants here. Yeah, very creative. And and it, it certainly adds to the quality and the fun of the camp. But I guess something else, you're doing additional networking yes. with musicians in your community who, as you say, may never have heard of New Horizons, may never have even educated adults. Um, and so this, this is a unique opportunity to also do some marketing for, for the New Horizons group. Particularly people don't realize that more adults take private music lessons than do students, young people, people, you know, from yeah. junior high to high school age. And so there is a whole market out there of people who just want to learn an instrument. So they take lessons, but they don't have anywhere to play. Yeah. Maybe they don't think they're good enough yet for the community band. Mm-hmm. You know, it uh, helps to grow the organization. Oh, yeah, absolutely. From your perspective as a conductor and, and teacher here at, at, at a camp, uh, how is this for you and what sort of things do you see during these five days? It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, you, it's just watch people grow. Watch people start to to tune in, they they know things that they don't realize they know. And then you kind of guide them to to have greater realization of, of ensemble, of playing together, a greater realization of intonation, of listening, particularly when you're doing a clarinet choir, that's different than being in a whole band, and listening, and listening within your section, and just watching the growth, they experience new music, maybe something that's totally different than their band had ever played before. We have full orchestra this year because we brought in the strings. So now we got our people being able to participate with the strings in a full orchestra setting that most of them have never had that opportunity before. And it's a whole different world and a different way of playing. So we're just trying to broaden their horizons and it's just so so neat to see them and see how they're reacting. You can tell they're really into it and they're making friends and meeting new people and it's just a, a wonderful is a wonderful vibe to the whole week. Yes, there sure is. This morning I was walking around a bit and I saw you working in a rhythm class. I was impressed first of all with the number of students that are in the class showing how much interest there is to learn rhythms. How complex that continues to be also for people who are uh, more advanced in playing. They still want to keep revisiting that. Uh, you had a wonderful setup um, in, in teaching that class. Say a few words about the specific sort of difficulties that rhythm reading brings with it. A lot of people our age-ish were not necessarily brought up in a band program where really understanding rhythm and having a system which helps you understand how that rhythm works. They just were never taught that. So they've kind of learned through osmosis. They've learned by listening and playing, but they don't really have a system to really break that rhythm down and understand exactly how it works and to give them that the tools to be able to figure out rhythms on their own by having a system. I thought that was an important thing to do. And we do it in a fun way and we're Mm. using rhythm sticks and we do different things and echoing and different things, but they're really learning how to look at that rhythm as something they can understand and know exactly how it goes rather than just saying 16th notes and thinking, oh, they're fast. Mm -hmm. Well, what does fast mean? It's not really fast. They just don't last as long because they're a quarter of the beat instead of the whole beat. So you start thinking about it in a different way and teaching them that, and all of a sudden it makes their approach to what they see on that printed page make a lot more sense. Yes, absolutely. If there was somebody out there who would approach you and say, look, at I've heard that you teach for this New Horizons group. I am very scared to even start with anything. I don't know how to play an instrument or it's been so long ago. What would you tell them? Well, if they had once upon a time played, I will say to them that muscle memory is a real thing. And even though you think you have no idea how to do this, Once you start playing again, your muscle memory will start kicking in. Your muscle memory is real, and there's things stored there that you can access again. And if you've never played an instrument again, well, the biggest thing is that you want to. 
So we're going to take you from ground zero and get you to where you can play in the band. And I have done that with people who've come to our band mm -hmm. where they had not played an instrument. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it is possible. And so I just, just a lot of encouragement. And then when they get to a certain point where they can play enough and they want to be in the full band, teaching them how to modify their music or modifying it for them so that they can play and participate. I mean, they're not playing all the notes, but that's okay. They'll get there. But for now, they get that joy of, oh my gosh, I'm playing in a in a group, mm -hmm. and this is this is really neat. Oh my goodness, I'm really doing this. And the fact that we don't get to a point that we can't learn. Yes, we can. I don't care if you're 16 or you're 86. You still can learn as long as you have the desire to do so. Right. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for everything you do for your local group, for the larger international music organization by planning and organizing these fabulous events and weeks for so many of us, and just for all you do, your passion and your musicality, your kindness is just shining through through days like this. It's been an absolute honor to get to know you, Susan. And Thank you very much for doing this podcast. Well, thank you very much. I am enjoying my week. Thank you. I would like to thank Susan Shermer for giving this interview. If you would like to find out more about Susan's New Horizons Band of Cincinnati, please go to newhorizonsbandcincinnati.org. Music for this podcast by Mary Riddle, Swag On. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Music Forever. If you are interested to be interviewed for this podcast, please email us at nimapodcast at gmail.com. That is N-H-I-M-A podcast at gmail.com. See you next time. Thank you.